Um, good evening, everyone. Um, before I proceed, I would like to make a humble request to, e to everyone present over here to kindly switch off your phone or you can keep it on silent mode so that we do not have any interruptions uh, during the session. And <clears throat> let me introduce myself. My name is Kunga Chindan, Program Coordinator of Tibet House, the Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, and I'll be moderating today's session. On behalf of Tibet House, the, cult the Cultural Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I would like to extend our warm welcome to our chairperson, Professor Vivek Sunejaji, former Pro Vice Chancellor of Delhi University and former Head and Dean of Faculty of Management Studies, University of Delhi. Our guest speaker, Mr. Ashish Kothari ji, founder member of Kalpa Vriks, member of many people's movement. Right, so with this, now may I request um, our chairperson, Professor Vivek Suneja ji, guest speaker, Mr. Ashish Kothari ji, and our director, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula, to kindly light the lamp of eternal wisdom and proceed to the dais. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I request every one of you to kindly give them a, a big round of applause. Thank you. All right. Um, with this, uh, we'll begin the session. For, we'll begin today's session. Um, before we begin this lecture, I would like to briefly introduce you all about Tibet House and its activities. Tibet House, New Delhi, was established in 1965 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet for the purpose of preserving the cultural heritage at the time when it faced forceful challenges in Tibet, as well as for providing a center for Tibetan culture and Buddhist studies. His Holiness the Dalai Lama's recurring emphasis on developing a sense of universal harmony and compassion as its own effective antidote to global suffering, together with the needs for a meaningful exchange between different religious and cultural tradition also had a profound effect on the purpose and its activities of Tibet House. Tibet House aims to bring together Buddhist masters and Tibetologists, people across different disciplines, students and practitioners, and the common men through its various programs and events. Tibet House continues to expand its objective in saving Tibet's heritage and in exploring and working towards Tibet House potential contribution to the ethical development of the modern society. Over a period of, period of five decades since its inception, Tibet House has come to recognize as a significant institution for the dissemination of Tibetan culture and for Nalanda Buddhist studies. Tibet House has a museum of valuable Tibetan art and artifacts as well as a library with nearly 5,000 volumes of manuscripts and books, a resource center, a conference hall, a gallery, and a bookshop. Tibet House offers various study programs on Nalanda Buddhist philosophy, conferences on interdisciplinary subjects such as neuroscience and Buddhist psychology, quantum physics, spiritual ecology, and universal ethics, a publication unit which publi publishes several books a year, and a program division which regularly organizes lectures, seminars, conferences, film screenings, and exhibitions. Tibet House also offers four different courses on Buddhist philosophy, psychology, and Tibetan language course. First, the first batch of Nalanda Master's course, which was launched on 9 December 2016, on the occasion of 51st anniversary of Tibet House, New Delhi, in the gracious presence of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, along with Sri Kiran Rijijuji, the Union State Minister of Home Affairs, and Sri Najib Jung, Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, the first batch of Nalanda Master's course, Batch 1, is completed with 372 students from 44 different countries. The second batch of Nalanda Master's course on Nalanda Buddhist philosophy has already, has already started in July, in which 
around 900 participants are enrolled from 54 different countries. Secondly, the Nalada Diploma course was launched in 2018. Three batches have been successfully completed so far. Nalanda Diploma course, which is a 14-month course, this course is designed specifically to accommodate people who are more seriously interested in Buddhist philosophy while being in the midst of busy, busy schedule with other engagements and commitments. Till now, we have successfully completed with three batches and the fourth batch of Nalanda Diploma course is now being offered both offline and online with a total registration of 1,770 participants from 73 different countries across the world. Third, Tibet House is pleased to present the second batch of Nalanda Certificate course, which has commenced on 7th January 2024 with active registration of 1,371 participants from 80 different countries. I would also like to inform you all that the last date of registration is on 31st January 2024. Now, Tibet House also offers Tibetan language courses on a regular basis. There are four levels of learning offered at the very nominal fee with special discount for students and monastics. Until date, 25 batches have been successfully completed and the 26th batch has commenced on December 1st, 2023 um, and is running successfully with a total registration of 127 participants. Now, uh, may I request our secretary, Mr. Tenzin Kunjablad, to give you the welcome address. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mula. Uh, good evening, everyone. Respected Professor Vivek Sunijiji, uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Mr. Ashish Kotariji, uh, Tibet House Director Keshe Tojdamdila, dear friends of Tibet House and advocates of environmental harmony who are gathered here today on a chilling Saturday evening. Uh, it is with immense pleasure that I extend a heartfelt welcome to you all on behalf of Tibet House to our, our annual Spiritual Ecology Lecture. Today our focus converges on the pivotal theme, the ethics of radical ecological democracy. Uh, this morning, uh, our program coordinator informed me that our director wanted, uh, wanted me to uh, give the welcome address, so I did some minor research of my own. Uh, the environmental problem is global, not only because it poses risk to the humanity, but also because its solution requires significant universal effort. It is challenging to the humanity in general and each individual person in particular. In today's world, we are faced with the need to recognize our moral duty to nature. Environmental pollution primarily affects the life of animals. The mass death of animals due to oil spills, radiation, pesticides, etc. has become familiar to all of us. How does spiritual ethics solve this problem? Buddhist tradition recognizes that animals, like humans, are sentient beings capable of emotions and some level of thought. As such, there is no question that animals are capable of suffering and that humans should also consider their needs when making ethical decisions. The understanding of law of karma can help to overcome the gap between actions and their consequences. The law of karma states that all our actions, words, and thoughts from, uh, form the conditions of our existence in the future. Each of us experiences the consequences of what we think, what we say, and what we, de or what we do. Thus, the law of karma encourages a person to take responsibility for his current life as well as all our future ones. Even a bee, uh, when taking honey from a flower, it does not damage the flower. Each member of the ecosystem of animal, plants, and microorganisms has a role to play to keep a healthy ecosystem. Uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama says that as a Buddhist monk, my concern, his concern extends to all the members of the human family and indeed to all sentient beings who suffer. So I hope that today's lecture brings us together to strive to cultivate a deeper meaning, a deeper understanding of our responsibility to nature 
and spiritual dimensions that guide our connections to the environment. I extend my deepest gratitude to Dr. Ashish Kothari ji for accepting our invitation and Professor Virushundar ji to chair today's session. Uh, thank you and I uh, hope you all enjoy the enlightening discussions ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Tenzin Kunjabla, for putting a light and you know emphasizing on the very importance of the environment and the ecology for which we are gathered here. Right. Now, coming back to our main event today, as we all are gathered here for the annual Spiritual Ecology Lecture on the theme, Eternity in a Second, the Ethics of Radical Ecological Democracy, which focuses on this pluriverse, placing it in the context of the ecological, socio-cultural, political and economic crisis that the world faces. And Tibet House is absolutely delighted to invite you all for this annual spirit lecture on spiritual ecology, as it is one of the highlight programs. And we organize this lecture every year, keeping in mind the importance of environment, conservation, and our responsibility as a human being. I would convey my sincere appreciation to Mr. Ashish Kotariji for taking out the time, keeping its importance, and accepting our invitation for today's lecture. Thank you, sir. On this note, I would now, I would now request our Honorable Chairperson, Professor Vivek Sunejoji, to kindly begin the session. And, all right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, wonderful to have so many warm-hearted people warming up a cold Saturday evening. Uh, I think half the job is done. And uh, the rest, our Honorable Speaker will do justice to. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Um, anything that is holiness, <laughs> Dalai Lama and Tibet House under him organizes is blessed. So uh, we are all blessed to be here together. Uh, we saw the wonderful work that's happening in Tibet House. Uh, uh, my dear friend Doji is in uh, the one who is stewarding all the... Uh, and I think many of you go to Tibet House, some of you, to regularly to attend his programs. Some brilliant stuff going on. And one of the most important uh, functions that uh, Tibet House does every year is this annual spiritual ecology lecture. Uh, in fact, I was uh, just remembering I was also chairperson, thanks to Doji, in the last uh, spiritual ecology lecture we had which was on the warming of the, the Arctic. And um, uh, I realized one whole year, therefore, has gone, you know, the Earth has gone round the sun once. Uh, I don't know whether I'm any wiser, but I'm certainly older. And it's great to be back here. I was just noticing the wonderful poster we have up here. Huh? Uh, you have the Buddha there, and there's a people tree. Yeah? The... Uh, it, there's only one uh, plant whose botanical name has the word religion in it. So in, this, this is called religiosa, uh, figus religiosa. Yes, the people tree. Because uh, the Buddha, so this is ecology. Uh, when he meditated, it was under a tree. And if you notice the shape of the leaf of the people tree, it is heart shaped. Yeah, it's, it's coincidental. It's almost a heart. Nobody cuts the people tree. In India, yeah, nobody does it just because the Buddha sat under it and meditated. And maybe something of the people tree in the heart leaves there helped the Buddha achieve enlightenment. There's already some ecology there. Of course, there's all the Jatak tales of all his previous lives as animals with the Buddha. And then, of course, you have His Holiness planting a tree there, your birds. Uh, it's, it's just a beautiful grand poster and look at the name uh, eternity in a second so when i saw this um, I, I was reminded of this great poem some of you might have heard it by william blake uh, the poem is called auguries of innocence and there's this one stanza there which is my favorite stanza in all of english poetry uh, it says to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. I'll repeat that. So see the, to see the world in a grain of sand, in heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand 
an eternity in an hour. Today, it's eternity in a second. So I'm most intrigued. I was just asking, uh, you know, you must explain how in a second you can see eternity. Timelessness. Eternity perhaps is not long periods of time. It is beyond time. It's timeless. But we'll, we'll wait and see why that has been chosen. Uh, infinity in the palm of your hand. Um, spiritual ecology. I'll just take a couple of minutes and I don't want to get in the way. Uh, it's very interesting, the topic. Ecology we hear about. Spirituality we hear about. Spiritual ecology. That's most fascinating. What is What on earth is that supposed to be? I think in Buddhism, in Vedanta, in Sufism, I think all religions are basically clear. This is a dream of form. Our eternal reality is beyond form. It's formless. It's infinite. It's uh, illimitable. It's, it's, the essence of it is love and beauty and goodness and joy. Uh, bodies come and go. Matters come and go. Emotions come and go. Uh, these things are ephemeral. We are eternal. All of you here, we are eternal. We are one and eternal. It's a play of form. Yeah? But if, he, if there has to be a play of form, uh, let's have a good play. Let's have, to have a good sport. Um, let's not make it a war. I often tell my students of management who often are so narrowly focused on profits and competitiveness and so on. I say, look, life is a game. So there's a badminton court right outside. I say, if you play badminton, if you play it trivially, yes, then there's no fun. Yeah, you have to play it hard. You have to play. But play it as a sport. For God's sake, it's just a game. If you get your egos invested and if you get depressed because the other guy has beaten you, it's no longer a game. It's war. Then it's Russia, Ukraine. Collective egos and war. It's the Gaza. What have you. So if there has to be a player form, let's make it a good game. And remember, it's just a game. So we'll wake up. Remember, it's a game. Maybe continue to play the game for the heck of it. Yeah, until you decide not to. But it's a play of form. So spiritual ecology. Spirit is what we are, which is formless, infinite, eternal. Play of form. Let's make it a good game. And if the play of forms, human being is only one form. We arrive very late on this planet. Yeah, Homo sapiens. Sapiens, by the way, means wise. Yes, I don't know how wise we are. Uh, Homo sapiens, we arrived very late on this planet. Yeah, the Big Bang happened 14 billion, 14.6 billion years ago. We've been hardly there for some million years ago. In fact, Homo sapiens been there very, and civilization, so called, is what 3,000 years old. And already, we are eliminating the right of every other form to exist. Yeah, whether it's the butterfly or the Amazon beetle, uh, we're saying we're the only form who can have fun. The rest out. I think that's rather silly. And that might eliminate us as well, uh, too. So global warming, pollution, what have you. So we have to have an alternative paradigm. This one won't work. It's not working. And we'll see what other options there are. So I just read out um, the little bio I have of Ashish Kuthari ji. And then we'll have his uh, uh, presentation followed by questions. Uh, Mr. Ashish Kuthari is the founder member of Gulf Rich and active in various people movements. He taught at the Indian Institute of Public Administration, coordinated India's biodiversity strategy and action plan, and served on Greenpeace boards. He's a judge on the International Tribunal on Rights of Nature and helps coordinate Vikalp Sangam and Global Tapestry of Alternatives. He has co-authored and edited various books, including Churning the Earth, Alternative Futures, and Pluriverse, a post-development dictionary. So we are most honored and most privileged uh, and thank David House for bringing to us the annual Spiritual Ecology Lecture 2024 to be delivered by Mr. Ashish Kothari, Eternity in a Second, The Ethics of Radical Ecological Democracy. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vivekji. That was most uh, generous of you. Um, well, uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many people here, as you said, in a, in a very chilly, uh, and I shouldn't say polluted because that's cliched in Delhi, uh, night, uh, evening. So it's fantastic. Um, thanks a lot to Tibet House, to Geshe La, to uh, Tenzing La, Chodan La, 
Domala, everybody who's been part of uh, organizing or making this happen. I know because we also organize things like this and I know how much work goes into the, you know, behind the scenes uh, by lots of people who uh, often don't get acknowledged. So many, many thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to get straight, I think, into the presentation and, uh, and then hopefully there'll be enough time, maybe half an hour or more for uh, open discussion, questions, challenges, comments. Okay, uh, as Vivek ji has said, the mystery of this uh, title, Eternity in a Second. Um, oh. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm going to put up one image which explains, describes this title. This happened to me a few months back. I was at uh, the uh, wonderful Adirapalli Falls in Kerala and while going down uh, I, I was watching with great amusement and interest a uh, uh, group of uh, young monkeys, monkey juveniles and babies playing with each other. Anybody who has seen monkey by babies playing with each other know that you can watch them for hours. I was watching them and then on the way back up I just happened to stop and take photographs of one of them and it was looking at me, I was looking at it. It's very interesting because always through my life I've been told that looking into the eyes of a monkey is uh, often a sign of aggression, so you should not do it. But here we were doing it and I could not see any aggression. Probably the monkey baby also could not see any aggression. So I just stretched out my hand just experimentally. A colleague of mine from behind was saying, careful, it will scratch you. Um, it bent down, smelt my fingers and then magically reached out and touched for a second my fingers. Now, for me, um, it was a moment that's described, it's impossible to describe that moment, that, that moment, it was not even a second, it was a split second, um, of um, <laughs> this feeling that I've gone, kind of gone back into millions of years of evolution, forward into millions of years of further evolution. Um, something inside me, it's not the heart, I think the entire body and the entire soul, everything was kind of touched in, in that one split second. Um, it's the kind of experience that I think uh, a lot of people, especially in our cities, simply don't get. But it is that life transforming moment. And of course, if it happens to us when we are much younger, and it has happened a number of times, this is from 30 years back with a penguin in Argentina. I was watching a group of penguins. This particular one came up all the way to my feet, looked up like that, pecked me on my foot and then went about doing its own business. And there's those moments, you know, you can have those moments with other animals, you can have them with uh, other plants, you describe the people tree, there are so many trees under which you just, there's that one moment that you have where sun is shining down through it, the tree is looking at you, you're looking at the tree, you're feeling it. Um, it is those moments that actually tell you that there's something special to be alive on planet Earth. And that is not just me and you but it's millions and millions and millions and millions of other life forms. And that therefore, even when one looks at, for instance, kids playing in the sea in Lakshadweep with gay abandon and learning from nature, learning from the sea, learning from the waves, learning from the fish, that what they grow up with, what some of us who may have been lucky enough to have these experiences grow up with is very, very, very different from the life that we are actually giving to people and to other species when in the name of development this is what we are doing to the earth. There's something unspeakably sad and tragic about this. It's not just the facts and figures of how many species we are losing and how much land is being destroyed and how much forest is being deforested and things like that. Those are important. But beyond that it's just this uh, uh, it's it's a great it's a feeling of utter sadness and um, anguish when you see something like this and when you see that that's happening in the name of human development and progress. So in this presentation today, I'm going to build on this uh, theme, build on it, uh, not just in terms of reason and rationality and so on, but also emotion, also feeling, everything put together because I don't think one can separate 
these things, unlike what modernity tells us, that ra- rationality and reason has to be separated from emotion. Don't put emotion into your decision making, etc. Um, so I'm going to try and put all of this together in the rest of the presentation. We have a very, very profound disconnect with our home. The word ecology comes from the word oikos, which means home. And uh, Professor uh, Satish uh, Kumar, who started the Schumacher, one of the people who started Schumacher College, uh, Jain Monk, I'm sure Gishala would know him and many others would know him. Uh, he once told me this interesting story. He said he went to the in London School of Economics and he asked the dean there, uh, where is your uh, ecology school? And she said, why should there be an ecology school in the London School of Economics? And he said, actually, the London School of Economics should be housed within a school of ecology because do you know the meaning of economics and actually that dean didn't, didn't know the origin of the word economics and he said economics comes from ecology oikos just like ecology ecology is the understanding of home economics is the management of home now, how can you manage your home unless you first understood it unfortunately as uh, in our modern pathways of development and what mainstream economists tell us um, that has been lost there's a clear separation that's been made as a result of which we have this very, very profound disconnect. We've already crossed many of the, you know, this is talking, let's say, science. We've crossed many, many of the ecological boundaries, the planetary boundaries that we should be bounded within. We are using resources at one and a half times the resource that the Earth can replenish. Uh, and of course, we know that climate change is no longer in the future. It's already here um, in many, many different forms wildfires, floods, uh, extreme heat waves, and millions of people, tens of millions of people already badly affected by the climate crisis. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not just in terms of ecology with you know respect to other species and things like that. Even if one doesn't care about other species and we just care about human beings itself, you realize that actually behind the glamour and glitz of a city like New Delhi or Mumbai that you see on the screen, lies also the lives of hundreds of millions of people who are actually bearing the brunt of that glamour and glitz and who are actually helping to clean up all the waste of that glamour and glitz, including from the houses of many of us. Um, You see uh, livelihoods such as what you see at the bottom picture there of uh, millions of people in India who are basically just trying to earn a living cleaning up our waste that comes out from our Uh, the the homes of of the rich and the powerful. And so along with the ecological crisis, we have an intersecting crisis of inequality and as a consequence of inequality, deprivation of many, many different kinds. Again, hard statistics are there, but beyond the statistics, it's really about looking at how greed, wealth, the power of the rich and the powerful to do anything that they wish or that we wish and what that means for the rest of the planet, both other human beings and other species. And from that, the question of what is development itself? This is something I've been asking myself and the groups I work with have been asking ourselves. We, we all, virtually all countries of the world except Bhutan, uh, tend, and Bhutan actually is also moving in that direction now, unfortunately, tend to think of development as economic growth, that you, the more materials consumption, the more energy consumption, the more the throughput of material and energy in the economic system, the more developed a country is, economic growth rates. We, we need to reach 7%, 8%, 10% economic growth. China and India have been uh, racing each other and uh, India claims to be the second highest and probably now the highest economic growth rate in the world. What does that mean? For some of us, it means a lot. We have access to virtually every material good that we need from anywhere in the world now. Um, We have relatively comfortable lives, etc, etc. But for a whole lot of other people and the rest of the planet, it actually means destruction and devastation. That's an advertisement from about 30 years back uh, from an Indian multinational corporation called Dotsal. And in the ad, I don't think you can read the text there, but the text basically talks about how nature is a barrier to development, to human development, and how Dotsal helps to remove that barrier by cutting through rainforests in Indonesia, digging the earth in India, and laying pipelines. The second image, which uh, I still haven't found the uh, the illustrator of, Anonymous, uh, tells you another part of the same story, that in this rush away from what were livelihoods, that is to say occupations based on relating to the rest of nature, 
culture, everything to put together, whether it's farming or uh, crafts or fisheries or whatever, um, to now the mass industrial production system in which the vast majority of workers actually have nothing creative to do. They're just part of, they're just cogs in a system in which some final product is being made uh, for our consumption, uh, which is what I call then moving from livelihoods to deadlyhoods. You have jobs, but those jobs are soul deadening. They're not creative. Right? We also have a, a, a the crisis of democracy itself. And I'm arguing that this is connected to the same pathways of development and economic growth. Because when somebody challenges it, when I as a farmer don't want to give my land for a bullet train or for anything else like that, which people in, in, in New Delhi are dreaming up or, you know, the Chardham roads or whatever, I get called anti-development. If I stand up enough and speak uh, loudly enough, I get called anti-national. If I speak up a little louder than that, I may, might even be called terrorist or seditionist. And then linked to the so-called Naxal movement and things like that. Across the world, people who are simply defending their ways of life, defending their territories, their forests, their water, their, you know, their right to continue the way of life that they want, uh, are killed. That figure is already old. It's now six people a week being killed. And how many dozens and hundreds more uh, being imprisoned or wounded or beaten up or whatever, simply for defending their rights. All of these crises and many more that I could speak about, I don't want to speak any more about crises. I don't want to depress everybody. Everybody's already partly, partly depressed anyway with the state of the world, um, are intersecting. You can't separate the ecological crisis from the political crisis, from the cultural crisis. They are intersecting. The roots of these crises are intersecting and they are, in fact, for a very large number of people on the planet, they come together so that they are actually facing the worst living conditions, the worst working conditions, the worst conditions uh, in terms of the, the environment in which they live. Uh, and also, of course, uh, being at the, uh, at the losing end of, of the economic, uh, the, the ladders and rungs. Now, the same system that's actually creating these, and I'll get to that in a minute, is giving us what it considers or what it wants us to consider solutions. So if you look at the... Uh, Climate uh, conferences of parties, we've already had 28 without solving the climate crisis. I don't, I don't know how many more conferences of parties will happen. Uh, the solutions that are being offered are things like carbon trading, uh, market mechanisms to solve the climate crisis, techno fixes like these huge geoengineering projects that will suddenly apparently cool the planet and so on and so forth. Uh, which, uh, or even things like electric vehicles. Both our governments and many other governments of the world are really promoting this as this is the solution to the climate crisis. Is it? Because with electric vehicles, for instance, somebody somewhere is losing their homes because there's lithium mining that has to happen. They've now found lithium in Kashmir and that's, a, to me, a very scary process, uh, thought that what's going to happen in Kashmir now with uh, for, the, for, for electric cars. Uh, and what we're not doing is, if you look at the image on the, on the right-hand side, this is the number of people who can be carried by 30 or 40 cars can be carried by one bus. The solution is not electric cars. The solution is how do we actually think much more differently and fundamentally uh, differently in terms of commoning, for instance, transport systems. And I'll come uh, back to that as a, as a sort of solution, um, uh, commoning as a solution. This is happening in India. For the last few years, we've had these so-called Atmanirbhar Bharat budgets, and in that, uh, coal mining is being expanded. So it's very interesting, it's ironical that actually communities who are currently Atmanirbhar, Adivasi communities in Chhattisgarh, for instance, who are already self-reliant to a large extent, are being displaced in the name of Atmanirbhar Bharat because coal mining has to be extended there so that India can be energy self-reliant. Uh, ease of doing business, make in India. You know, craftspersons are saying we already make in India. Why do you need to get people from outside to actually come and make in India? There's already so much happening here itself, which can be focused on. Uh, so whether it's in the form of the sort of traditional conventional models of development, or it is in the form of the new so-called climate solutions and energy solutions and all of that, land grab, grabbing of resources, especially from the most marginal sections of society continues.
that figure of 60 million is from what 10 years back of people physically uprooted from their lands for big dams and mining and 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 things like that what's the solution to me humanity's single most important question is are there alternatives are there ways of meeting human needs and aspirations without trashing the earth and without causing the kinds of inequalities and deprivations that I've talked about. And I'm going to focus the rest of my presentation on that because I think there is, in fact, a lot of good news on that front, uh, which I want to uh, bring to you. I think there's two kinds of alternatives. One is where people are actually saying, no, enough is enough. We're not going to give our lands. We're not going to give our waters. And we're not saying simply that don't bring a factory here or don't bring a dam here and make it somewhere else. We're saying not just not in my backyard, but not in anyone's backyard. We're challenging the fundamentals of what you are bringing, you as in the government or economists or whoever are bringing to us as development. Let me give you two these two examples. Some of you may be familiar with them. The picture with the human garland across the river, that's in the Indravati River from the 1980s, of 300 Adivasi villages. Uh, and Baba Amte, who some of you would know, uh, was also there, who protested against two mega hydroelectricity projects. And in that protest, what they were saying not was not simply that we don't want 300 villages to be displaced and our forests to be drowned. Of course, that was part of the articulation. But also, they, tell, they, they were telling the government, they said, when you look at the river, you think of it as a commodity, as hydropower and megawatts. For us, the river is our mother. This is a fundamentally very, you know, two very different civilizational outlooks all together. And they were saying, we will not allow our mother to be shackled by your dreams of progress. In fact, those were successful, those dams were never built. The second image is from Niyamgiri in Odisha, where the Dongriya Kond uh, indigenous people fought against a mining, proposed mining project by, uh, ironically enough, a corporation called Vedanta. A UK based corporation and they were saying uh, that we don't want the mining. So when they were asked, well, why do you not want the mining and do, can you give us permission? Supreme Court actually said, please take permission from all the Gram Sabhas involved for if you want to do mining, they told the government, so the government went there. And the Adivasi said, who are we to give you permission? The land doesn't belong to us. The forests don't belong to us. They belong to Niyam Raja. Who is Niyam Raja? Niyam Raja is the deity who actually owns these hills. Go and ask him. <laughs> so, this is like lots of head scratching and saying, how do we ask Niyam Raja? Anyway, finally that also, that mining so far at least has, uh, has been stopped. But for every successful process like this, unfortunately, uh, many, most movements actually do fail because the power, the sheer power of corporations and governments proposing these things is, is much too high. But why it's important to point these out as alternatives is because they're not simply saying no to something, they're also articulating a different vision of relating to the rest of nature and to each other, which is in sheer contrast to the dominant uh, model of development. Now that you can think of such movements all over the world, uh, whether it's uh, the um, uh, youth climate justice movements or the movements for new constitution in Chile right now, uh, or the peace movements in Burma, Myanmar against the military uh, uh, government. Uh, or even, uh, you know, in a way, the farmers movement in India, many others which are actually in that sense protesting, but also articulating a different vision. But along with that, there are, there's another kind of alternative, which is constructive alternatives, meeting basic needs and aspirations. In the last 10-15 uh, years, we've actually been documenting hundreds of examples of these across India. And I will show you a website later on where there's 2000 stories of this kind of constructive um, alternatives to meeting basic needs like water and housing and sanitation and energy and all of that. But beyond that also voice and decision making, gender justice, education, health. The same thing is across the world. Uh, and at the end, I'll, I'll talk about a book. There's a copy of that lying outside for you to see, uh, which has 100 examples from all over the world. Um, incidentally, this map is one of my favorite uh, images because every time I show this, at least here in India, people say, why is it upside down? And that leads to a very interesting conversation about how the so-called right side up map where Europe is on top and Africa is shown to be much smaller than it actually is. This is the actual size of the continents. Uh, is a colonial colonial time map. It was made deliberately so that Europe was on looking at top and Europe was seen to be much bigger. And you could actually see England, which you can't see here. 
so uh, you know there's a lot of decolonization that has to happen in in our own minds in our languages in our cartography in our you know everything that we're actually doing um so but let me give you a few examples of these grounded alternative ways of trying to meet basic needs this is my absolute favorite because it comes from the most marginal section of india society this is dalit women dalit as we know exploited for hundreds of years as so called untouchables and so on and so forth as women also in a patriarchal society uh, severely marginalized till about 35 years back these women and their families faced extreme situations of hunger malnutrition no access to education health etc and of course social uh, ostracization and and so on then they got together as women sanghas in about 70 75 villages and a federation called deccan development society they brought back their traditional varieties of uh, millets especially but also rice and other and pulses and so on they switched completely to organic they completely rejected green revolution all hybrids gmos everything was rejected all chemicals they shared their seeds they shared their knowledge uh, they fought against privatization they fought for the rights of women over land because usually land in india belongs to or is in is titled to to men Uh, and a whole bunch of other things i mean i'm cutting a 35 year old story down into 2 minutes so obviously i'm simplifying a lot but through all of that they were actually able to achieve food security um in a very this is one of india's driest areas by the way no external irrigation just whatever rain fell their own seeds their own knowledge everything for 5000 families and beyond that not just food security but what they said was annaswaraj food sovereignty which means our control over everything to do with food no corporate control no government control to uh, for everything to do with the production and the consumption of food very importantly especially for today's topic for them the earth and seeds are not just economic products uh, economic resources they are to be related to in the form of spiritual relations they are cultural they are spiritual they have their own life right and so every festival they celebrate all religious festivals there and in every festival they are actually celebrating the earth and seeds and with that of course their knowledge and water and everything else there are thousands of examples of this kind of communities sustaining uh, old ways of protecting nature or finding new ways of doing that uh, across the across the earth that website there uh, i can send it later also to people interested has hundreds of case studies of these kinds of uh, how you know people find themselves to be part of nature and therefore also responsible for protecting it in the best way possible this is a uh, all the way across the world now going away, away from india we are talking about uh, the amazon and here in the ecuadorian part of the amazon is the sapara indigenous nation uh, they call themselves nations which is different from nation state which we can discuss later if you're interested Uh, and here their their challenge is how do they sustain their traditional ways of life in which everything was a, a spiritual relationship as human beings with the stones with the river with the forest with the animals everything was a spiritual relationship um, they had their own cosmologies their own ways of interpreting dreams and their actions based on the interpretation of dreams how do they sustain that in the midst of the fact that they also are relating to the outside world so it cannot be an isolated existence so they're trying to figure out hybrid systems by which both their traditional knowledge and some elements of modern knowledge that they find uh, relevant um, are combined they have some need for money so they're actually trying to build uh, their own systems of medical of healing which outsiders can come and actually learn from and they earn some revenues from that without destroying or or, or distorting their own systems and i'll you know i'll keep talking about hybrid systems because in today's world we need those hybrid systems you cannot actually have uh, any one sort of uh, you know purest purest way of looking at, at this uh, here is another example of that these are communities in uh, different parts of the himalaya where uh, women or young people are actually they they have they're challenging the mainstream models of tourism they're saying why should tourists be coming here exploiting us and our resources and all the money is made by big tour operators and then they go away and we get nothing out of this except garbage and trash we can change that we can make it instead of tourism we can call it visitation people are visiting us when they visit us we will feed them what we eat we will tell them our cultures we will learn from their them their cultures and their ways of doing things it becomes a relationship 
which is well beyond the money that is transacted. So there's many examples of that in different parts of the Himalaya. And through that, actually, young people are getting an incentive to stay back in their villages and uh, earn the livelihood there, but also protect nature and sustain their own cultural traditions. Uh, here in central India, <clears throat> another very interesting example of, if you remember the image I showed you of the human garland across the river, um, some of those villages, once they were part of the movement, also started asking themselves saying, okay, we can have this movement against a government decision, but in our own villages, we have a number of problems, right? There's inequality, uh, women are not part of decision making, some people are cutting the forest and selling it off, etc. So what do we do? So they actually uh, revived their Gram Sabhas or their traditional Adivasi structures also of decision making and decided, started with one village called Medhaleka in Gachiroli district in Maharashtra, which said, from now on, we continue to elect the government in Mumbai and New Delhi, but in our village, we are the government. Nobody will take decisions relating to our village unless it has gone through our Gram Sabha. And we will also make sure that everybody in the village is has the power and the voice to speak in the Gram Sabha. So the women have had their own processes of generating that power, that, that knowledge, that capacity to be able to be equal partners in uh, decision making. Um, talking about uh, we are the government in our village, in India, we have some examples of that. They're small scale, but perhaps the biggest such experiment across the world is the Zapatista movement in what is today called Mexico. Now here, four decades back, the uh, indigenous uh, people there declared that from now on, whether the state of nation state of Mexico exists or not, in our across our entire territory, we are the ones who will be taking decisions. And that means that every settlement there is responsible for its own decisions, but then it confederates over across larger landscapes for the larger level processes of decision making. Later on, when I talk about the frameworks emerging, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. There's a similar thing happening in um, Central Western Asia, which is the Kurdish movement. Now, this is one of the most war-torn parts of the world. Nobody's yet been able to figure out how do you solve this problem of war between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. And currently, Turkey in particular is, is extremely is an extreme aggressor of various kinds. In the midst of uh, Palestine, Gaza, and uh, uh, Ukraine, this is an area that's kind of forgotten. But there's constant bombarding, there's war that's happening. There's 40 million Kurdish ethnic population here, which has been uh, traditionally um, uh, persecuted by all the nation states that they live within. But they've been fighting for their own independent, not nation state. And I'll come back to that later. They're fighting for their own independent Kurdistan in which they want to try and establish local direct democracy, everybody having a voice based on a very interesting eco-feminist ideology called genealogy. Jin means women. The genealogy is the what they say, the science of uh, women's revolution. Um, and um, I mean, I, again, there's lots to be told about this, but it's a very, very interesting example of an attempt to create peaceful uh, living with the earth and with each other kind of experiment in the midst of war and constantly threatened, of course. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, there's there's progress towards that and there's, you know, there's three, uh, two steps forward, three steps back, that kind of thing happening all the time because of the uh, surrounding states. Uh, over to another continent, Africa. In uh, the last few years, the uh, uh, South African uh, ecological groups, feminist groups, worker groups, trade unions have got together to create what they call a climate justice charter. They're saying if South Africa needs to move out of the climate crisis, we have to create uh, new jobs for all those who are going to lose jobs. If you shut down the coal mining and the thermal power stations, etc., what are those workers going to do? We need a just transition for these sorts of workers while at the same time dealing with the uh, ecological aspects of climate. So this is a very, very interesting process. Uh, do look it up. If you look at South Africa Climate Justice Charter, you'll find a lot of it available on the website. And finally, then uh, over to Europe. In the heartland of capitalist of the capitalist world, these are four examples that I've been lucky enough to visit of where people are trying non-capitalist ways of uh, running businesses, of running the economy, and of running society. Uh, I don't have the time to go into all of these, but for instance, the one on the bottom right-hand side is a factory that is run democratically by all the workers. 
Um, there's a big slogan on the factory saying, we have no boss. And every worker gets exactly the same wage per hour of work, regardless of what the work is. Now, that's <laughs> truly uh, revolutionary to my mind. Uh, the one on the right hand side is a school that is run by um, in very high quality teaching, but with very low fees because the entire community, including the parents and everybody surrounding the school, gives some hours every week for, say, administration or for teaching free of cost. They don't charge money because they realize that what they're doing is actually basically contributing to their own community's children, right? Uh, so that's called time banking. And there are many such examples across the world. Now, of course, traditionally, we've all had time banking and many places still do. Traditionally, in a village, if a farmer had to cut a harvest, you know, many other farmers would land up. Farmer would only have to give a feast maybe in the evening. Uh, if you had to rebuild your house, other people would land up. They would not ask for money. That kind of sharing of time goes well beyond an economy of finance. It is talking about an economy of caring and sharing, where social relations are at the foundation of the economy. So these are places where they're trying to go beyond the capitalist logic in the midst of a very capitalist society, trying to create uh, or recreate those sorts of systems. Uh, back to India, this is a very interesting example of, <clears throat> um, of uh, communities trying to create much more voice and bring ecology, etc. into the urban space. This is in Bhuj, which is an exploding town. And in Bhuj, uh, um, a lot of very poor people are living there because they've had to leave their villages with no jobs available and come into Bhuj town and looking for jobs and looking for spaces. And of course, you know, the same phenomenon of living in slums and so on. In the last 8-10 years, in a program called Homes in the City, these communities with some 5 or 6 uh, local NGOs have actually uh, established their own planning processes, created much more dignified housing, become self-sufficient in water, and you would realize that Bhuj is actually the driest part of India, um, and a whole bunch of other things through which they are arguing to the city administration why should towns and cities be planned only by bureaucrats and politicians? After all, the budgets you're making are supposed to be for us. So why are we not part of the decision making and the budgeting right from scratch? So that's what they're trying to achieve in Bhuj. Um, there are similar attempts at trying to transform urban life to be much more sustainable, to be much more um, democratic uh, and equitable and just in many, many different parts of the world. Finally, uh, a couple of other sectors that I'll give examples of, and then, then I move to the, the last part of my presentation. Um, technology and communication and media. All those of us who use the so-called social media or anti-social media, whatever, uh, we realize that we actually have no control over it. Today, it belongs to somebody. Tomorrow, it belongs to Elon Musk. Today, you know, Zuckerberg says we'll do something and then tomorrow he'll say something else completely. And we also know that these are all forms of media that are misused for all kinds of distortions, right? Whether it's electoral distortions or uh, cultural distortions as we're seeing right now. Um, so how do we actually re-democratize media or communications or technologies for that matter? We think of technological innovation as happening only in IITs or big corporations. For most of human history, technological innovation has happened by so-called ordinary people. Who invented the wheel? Does anybody know? It was none of the big corporations, nobody. But without the wheel, <laughs> none of what we're doing today would be possible. Uh, and so on. I mean, you can talk about thousands of exp uh, technical innovations like that. Uh, so the, these are examples of people trying to actually bring media, technology, communications back into a democratic space controlled by people, where people's voices can come out, where our truths can also be uh, put out there without being distorted in the way that is happening in mainstream uh, media communications, etc. And finally, learning and education. Uh, some of us have been lucky enough to be in schools or learning spaces where our innate creativity was encouraged, where we were not just not just our heads were stuffed with information, but you know there was an encouragement to use our hands and our heart and our feet and so on. But that's a tiny minority in India. The vast majority of young people in India unfortunately learn in institutions which uh, do not encourage any of this. They're just stuffing 
its heads with this is the right information this is what you spew out in the exams then move into the next class and and your goal in life is to become rich famous or powerful if possible all three these are institutions that are saying no that's not what education should be about education needs to be about <laughs> how do i become a fun human being but also a responsible human being responsible for other human beings but also for the rest of the planet how does my innate creativity actually get encouraged art is not just one kind which my teacher is telling me there can be 20 different forms of art right um or what gandhi ji called the nai taleem the head hands and and uh, heart all put together so these are uh, i mean if i had the time i would give you uh, detailed uh, descriptions of all these fantastic initiatives are trying to create these very different learning spaces the the picture on the bot in the middle there is a school that was started by the same dalit women farmers that i talked to you told you about pachashala and there that that guy there is actually teaching physics and chemistry to the students while the students are also learning how to make ganne ka juice uh, sugarcane juice yeah so there's hands there's head all of that is happening but also the teaching involves saying okay um, we can't grow sugarcane everywhere because that will be very disruptive of the ecology and the environment so how do we actually be restrained also in the way we are doing our farming so heart also and values kind of comes in um in uh, oh sorry just to go back to um, so one of my favorite pastimes is looking at the origins of words development for instance the word development is comes from the opposite of envelopment envelopment is to close in right so development was to open up means to open up opportunities it was nothing to do with per capita grow uh, income and gdp growth and all of that that's what has been distorted to become school comes from the word skule in greek which meant learning with leisure which is the exact opposite of 95% of india schools right so uh, you know in the way in which we actually in the last 2 3 4 hundred years or whatever with colonialism and development and so on even the original meanings of a lot of words have actually been fundamentally distorted in uh, during the covid pandemic uh, we were of course hearing all the horror stories of how communities were collapsing how work had stopped how people had to walk 2000 kilometers to get back home etc and i mean how so many people there many of our friends also actually uh, died or were very badly affected but then we started hearing stories of where communities were actually thriving through the pandemic not just surviving but thriving and this really made us curious what was happening there why is it that some communities had no problems at all so we started investigating and putting stories together and we now have 100 stories from across the world about 70 actually from india of why this was the case and it was very interesting that these were places these were places where communities had already or were quickly able to build a community health system so they had much more defenses against uh, the pandemic as a health crisis equally importantly they had localized economies their own food production or a very localized exchange in which their livelihoods were dependent not on long distance but on very localized uh, you know for instance uh, a uh, place called navdarshanam uh, very close to bangalore had a relation the farmers there had a relationship with consumers in bangalore and they were able to uh, convince the administration to let that exchange continue so the farmers still had a livelihood and the consumers still had great organic food uh, so what we learned in this in these 100 case studies is really that if one can really create or sustain those kind of localized relatively self reliant systems if we can sustain or create community responses not individual privatized but community level responses if we can sustain or create institutions of communities that are able to uh, survive those sorts of crises then we are much better off than in the current system in which there's so much individualization so much privatization so much breaking down of institutions so much dependence on an external entity whether it's a government or a corporation that as soon as a crisis hits you collapse that's going to happen with the climate crisis it's going to happen with many others covid was not the only pandemic there are more coming so let me now uh, go to the last part of the presentation building on these sorts of examples to say um, i mean i could go on for hours this talking stories so the telling is very very important and i love doing it but let me get to now looking at okay what are these stories telling us uh, i just talked about the lessons from the covid ex- covid examples but there are many others also So in the last few years 
one of the ways in which we are trying to understand these phenomena, you know, so look at it more holistically, is what we call this flower of transformation with five petals, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural knowledge and the ecological. There's a bit of an artificial distinction. Those of you who are academics here will feel comfortable with it. Uh, others may not. Uh, academics love making artificial distinctions, so that's fine. But uh, we know that life is not lived in these five uh, spheres or petals separately. There's intersections, messy intersections amongst them, and we'll look at those. But it's uh, another way of trying to understand this reality. And at the core of this, which is also the core of today's presentation, is a set of ethics and principles and values. Let me quickly, I, you know, I'm not going to go into detail on, on any of these, but just quickly look at some of what's emerging from these grounded initiatives. If we talk about democracy, and this year is obviously <laughs> very crucial for that, we think of elections. We think of, okay, once in five, we're, we're the world's largest democracy because we have the right to vote once in five years. In the 4.999 years in between, we may have no rights, but we have we can go and vote for another party into power if we don't like this particular one. What these initiators are saying is that's not democracy. Democracy is power of the people. It's my power, your power, our community's power to take decisions that affect our lives, not have somebody else taking those decisions for us. Original meaning of democracy, democracy, power of the people, not power of bureaucrats and politicians. Unfortunately, for decades, we've now given over, willingly given over that power because we believe that democracy is about elections. So we have to also start fundamentally altering this and looking at how do people get empowered to be decision makers uh, and not just give over all their power to, uh, to those we elect. Along with that has to also then come our power over the economy. There's no point in my having local political power if I have no power of how the land is going to be used or how the forest is going to be used or how the machinery is going to be used or who is controlling the currency, the rupee or the dollar or the euro, right? So therefore, the democratization of the economy, bringing back an economy of not just money, but caring and sharing, like the examples that I was giving you, uh, visibilizing the completely invisibilized role of uh, most women in the economy or grandparents, for instance, who look after grandchildren when parents are going off for work. That whole transformation of the economy, moving away from GDP and looking at real indicators of well-being. Does everybody have clean drinking water? Does everybody have clean air? Great question to ask in Delhi. Um, does everybody have access to good learning opportunities? Does everybody have a voice in decision making? Those become the indicators of well-being of, of a society or a country, not GDP. All of that has to go hand in hand with the third sphere, which is social justice. Because you could have potentially a cup panchayat kind of situation where there is local political uh, control, there is local economic control but where the women have no role in decision making, where the, the so-called lower castes are, uh, uh, continue to be ostracized and marginalized. So you need to also have the struggles for social justice, well-being, equality uh, against marginalization, etc. With that, the fourth sphere of cultural knowledge diversity. This is one of my favorite uh, um, stories. It comes from uh, Professor Ganesh Devi, very, very... Um, a renowned uh, linguist uh, in India who conducted uh, what I think is one of the most exciting experiments or uh, sorry projects in, in the world called the Big People's Linguistic Survey of India many years back and he came out with 50 volumes of uh, uh, covering 780 living languages not dialects full languages right so for instance Kachi is not a dialect of Gujarati it's its own language right Bhojpuri is not a dialect of Hindi it's its own language that's what they were saying now if you take this language diversity, and he told me after uh, once in a lecture, he was, you know, I was talking to him and he said, Ashish, do you know that Himachal Pradesh has 230 different terms for snow? One word snow, different times that the snow falls, there are different words, different sizes of snowflake, there are different words, the rapidity with which snow melts, there are different words. And he says, if we teach only in Hindi in all the schools of Himachal Pradesh, and we lose that whole language diversity, we are losing libraries of knowledge that could be crucial for dealing with the climate crisis. That's what's happening. We have 23, I don't know, 23 right now constitutional languages or 24, I don't remember exactly what. And most teaching happens, uh, takes place in one of those, right? Which means there's another 750 languages 
that are not being taught in our formal school systems. And uh, even though we talk about mother tongue language, mother tongue teaching, it doesn't actually happen. So that's just one example of knowledge diversity and language, uh, sorry, cultural diversity that is crucial. And the kind of struggles that are encompassed in these initiatives that I'm talking about are where people are trying to sustain that diversity, revive the diversity where it has been lost, and uh, struggle against homogenization, struggle against this thing that only one religion is important or only one language is important, or even that there is a national language, which as we know there isn't, but it is often imposed. So uh, these, these struggles for cultural diversity, knowledge diversity, and, cre and keeping knowledge in the commons. All the books that we produce are creative left, uh, com creative commons or copyleft, which means copyright, no. I mean, where are my ideas come from? They're not just created anew in my head. They've come because millions of people before me have done other things and I've sort of picked up here and there. So why should I be copywriting my presentation, for instance? Yeah. So against privatization of knowledge, privatization of uh, property, commons, etc. And finally, and uh, this is my favorite, uh, because I started off as an animal rights activist uh, 45 years back, is uh, what I would call radical ecology or ecological uh, or spiritual ecology. One can call it different things. Now, that figure on the bottom uh, is really, really telling. I learned the left side figure when I was doing biology, that we are a pyramid of life, human beings on top. Nobody actually told me at that point in time that there's some gender uh, bias also involved because the man on top and a woman below. But uh, people were saying that, no, we therefore have the right to rule the earth because we are a pyramid. We are the most intelligent uh, sapiens, right, supposedly. Uh, indigenous people, Adivasis, don't agree with this. For them, the second figure is truth. It's a circle of life. All species equal to each other. That's what Buddhism is telling us that's what so many religions are actually telling us at the fundamental core is uh, is uh, whether it's spiritual faiths or religions this is what actually we're being told but unfortunately we're living the last few hundred years like we are this ecological pyramid and we therefore have the right to do whatever we want to the rest of the earth so the struggles for um, reintegrating ourselves within nature we often say humans and nature whereas we should always be saying humans and the rest of nature Right, uh, reintegrating ourselves, thinking of ourselves as being, being part of nature, respecting all species like we want respect for ourselves, uh, the struggles for understanding that just like we think we have spirit and soul, other species may also have spirit and soul, and so therefore also the struggles for acknowledging the rights of other species, not just in a formal legal sense, but in a more fundamental sense of, of uh, respect and equality. This uh, is also very much fundamentally part of the sorts of transformations that we're talking about. Now, if you were to put these five different petals together, we can begin to imagine South Asia in a very different way. For historical reasons, pre-colonial and colonial, South, South Asia is divided into seven, six, seven countries. And what that has done is that uh, these are artificial boundaries. They have no you know, uh, basis in either culture or, or nature. What that has done, let's take Tibet and Ladakh. There used to be migration of wild animals and pastoral peoples and trade back and forth for hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, and for wildlife, millions of years. You create a boundary, you put a border, a, a fence, and you put armies on both sides. None of that is possible anymore. India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, the Gangetic Plains, the Ganga and all its tributaries is one ecological unit divided into three or four countries now. So India can make a barrage at Farakka, not caring about what happens to people and wildlife in Bangladesh. India is considering a dam in Indus, not considering what might happen to people in Pakistan or wildlife in Pakistan. China is making a huge dam just north of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, not caring what happens downstream to us uh, in, in, in India. Um, so how do we reimagine boundaries in South Asia from an ecological and cultural perspective, which is called bioregionalism or biocultural regionalism? 
there's very interesting experiments on this in many other parts of the world. In, in, in South Asia, it's still obviously very difficult to even argue this because people might call me anti-national if I say that boundaries should be opened up. Uh, but I think we really do need to start imagining and then moving towards a South Asia where cultural flows, ecological flows, economic flows, uh, where, for instance, the Sundarbans could be governed by the fishing communities that are both in Bangladesh and in India without a border in between. Or where, you know, let's dare to say that India, Pakistan, the communities that live on both sides could actually be governing that as a peace zone. These are things, I mean, let's, let's dare to imagine this. Because at the core of this flower of transformation is a set of ethics, principles, values that have to govern how we treat each other and treat the rest of the planet. I'm going to put these up there without going into any detail uh, and then I'll, I'll end in the next two, three minutes. Um, I, let me just point out one or two. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail in all, the, all of them, but for instance, I've been constantly talking about how these alternative initiatives are about cooperation, solidarity, the commons, not competition, which means we fundamentally have to change the education system, not uh, uh, sort of, you know, hostile uh, competition between economies and nation states and countries kind of thing, but more cooperation, not individual privatization, but the commons, especially with things like nature and, and knowledge. Uh, or for instance, saying that labor is not, why should somebody who writes about agriculture get more money than those who, the farmer who's actually cre creating, uh, producing the food? Yeah, it doesn't make there's no natural reason that has to happen. That's that's the way society has developed. So how do we actually give dignity to physical labor as much as to intellectual labor? Uh, which is not to say that drudgery is therefore accepted, but moving away from that, but also saying that physical labor. Um, happiness is not about, uh, you know, the Reliance ad saying happiness. The Republic of Happiness is about buying a 40-inch color, color television set or maybe now 56-inch, I don't know what the latest is, or an i15. What's the latest? iPhone 15 whatever. Uh, but it's really about having opportunities like this, of talking to each other, of being out in, you know, under a fantastic tree of, uh, of course, also having the material needs we need, you know, food and energy and so on. But um, thinking of qualitative happiness. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to all of these. Um, I'm just putting them out there. Um, <clears throat> what all of these put together actually signify uh, is worldviews that are celebrating where it's not our film stars and cricket stars and politicians who are celebrities, where it's that Dalit woman who is producing enough food for a family of 10 people on one acre of land in an ecologically sustainable way. That is the celebrity, which means it's worldviews that are actually celebrating life, not money, not power, not uh, fame. Okay, um, And that upturns a whole lot of things that we are otherwise used to. One of these worldviews could be uh, could go back into the ancient Indian uh, uh, concept of Swaraj, it's very badly defined as self-rule. But Swaraj was really about freedom, autonomy, self-determination, and I'm sure there are different terms in different uh, aspects. I think Geshe-la, you can tell us. I'm sure there are uh, you know Tibetan or Buddhist terms for this this kind of thing, where. It is about my and my community's freedom and autonomy and so on, but with responsibility to not do anything which will undermine your freedom and your happiness. So it's not the American notion of freedom where I can run my SUV wherever I want and I can bomb a country that doesn't give me cheap petrol because it's my free way of life. It is really about rights and responsibilities. It is about freedom with restraints. And we have uh, kind of more recently sort of extend that, extended that to say that responsibility not just towards other people, but also other species, right? So therefore, eco Swaraj. The concept of radical ecological democracy is very simple. Um, oh, as an aside, again, the word radical is very badly distorted. Radical does not mean people killing each other. Radicalized youth should not mean pe young people killing each other. Radicalized youth should mean people young people who are able to go to their cultural and ecological roots. It means going to the roots, right? There's nothing bad about the word. So what is radical ecological democracy? Very simple. We're all decision makers. We're born with that right. But we use our power of decision making with responsibility towards other people and towards other species. There are similar notions all over the world. 
the book Pluriverse, which you'll find a copy of outside, um, has about 90 of these. Some of them are from very old, thousands of years old indigenous people's uh, notions. Some of them are uh, the spiritual foundations of religions and, and a lot of religion is now people are kind of trying to revisit what religion should be, whether it's socially engaged Buddhists or uh, liberation theology in Christianity. Many are actually trying to raise that and I hope, I, I would wish that many more in Hinduism also do that right now especially. Um, is to say what are the spiritual foundations, which is really about solidarity and love and generosity, not about hating each other or thinking ours is the only religion on, on the planet. And then there are many uh, coming out from the belly of the beast, so to speak, from within capitalist societies. Degrowth in Europe is a very interesting example of that. Ecofeminism in many parts of the world are examples of that. So what is very important is that none of these are an umbrella over everything else. You can't say that Swaraj is a notion of, is a form of uh, degrowth or the other way around. They are unique. There's a pluriverse. That's why we use the word pluriverse and not universe. We have to move away from universities and become pluriversities. Multiple forms of knowledge, multiple ways of being and doing have to be taught. So that that is a really crucial part of this. Lastly, a uh, question that I always had asked, how do you achieve scale? There's so many fantastic examples that I've given and there's many, many more. But at the macro level, we still have the crises that we're in. How do we change that macro picture? Um, and I'm sure nobody has all the answers to that. But here's some thoughts. The more we can actually put resistance movements, constructive alternative movements together with each other, create more of a critical mass, learn more from each other, inspire other similar examples across the world, connect to them horizontally. Um, and the more we can not just do these practical examples on the ground, but also envision the societies that we want, create the utopian visions and then say, okay, how do we move there using whatever is already available? the more scale is likely to happen. And I'll just give you two examples of where that has happened historically. And I think we're on the cusp of a third one right now. One is the anti-colonialism movement. For 500 years, half the earth was colonized by uh, European countries. In the space of about 30 to 40 years, late 19th century, early 20th century, most of those were thrown out. That doesn't mean forms of colonialism aren't there. They are, but at least that form. And the second example is patriarchy. Uh, I can say, I think with some uh, confidence that most of the women sitting in this room right now would not be sitting here, were it not for the fact that a few individual women and small groups of women stood up 100 years back, 150 years back, Savitri Bhai Phule here, I mean, so many people in uh, all over the world who actually said, no, women have equal rights. And they suffered for it. They were killed. They were, you know, beaten up, et cetera, et cetera. But today, as a result of that and the growing movement of women's equality and rights, at least some of those forms of patriarchy are gone. Not everything is gone. There's still a lot, but some of them. And the third one I think that's going to happen is the ecological revolution as a revolution of the conscience and as a physical biophysical revolution because the more people realize the danger we are in with the climate crisis etc the more i think there will be both the consciousness and the physical action to change that two processes that we're involved in uh, to help with some of this uh, is one is based in india called vikalp sangam which is uh, all the, the groups that are involved with uh, these sorts of positive transformations in different fields, you know, whether it's uh, gender justice or food or agriculture, whatever, uh, to try and come together, learn from each other, uh, collaborate, um, challenge each other and create uh, visions of what India could look like. Um, we have been meeting everywhere, uh, many different parts of the country, 30 such sangams or confluence. These are not conferences, confluences of coming together and doing all of that, documenting positive stories so that they can inspire others. This is the website. Uh, I always tell people who are going into their exams, uh, young people that, uh, you know, take five minutes out and go to this website, you'll feel, you'll cheer up. It's, you know, you're probably depressed going into your exams. Um, so there's lots and lots of very, very interesting, positive, uh, inspiring stories uh, there. And of course, many more that need to be brought up. The articles, films, different ways in which you'll see them. And then building on that, connecting to similar processes everywhere in the world. Uh, we initiated this global tapestry, 
in 2019. It's called a tapestry because we don't believe in hierarchical processes. We believe, you know, like the old the traditional Godadi in India, you, you make a, a blanket out of a uh, hundred different little, little uh, pieces of cloth. So create a tapestry which, which uh, links up, up horizontally with similar objectives of collaboration, actions, joint advocacy, collective visioning of what the world could look like. There's lots and lots of uh, movements all over the world who are connected to this. And this is a, a website which gives you stories from other parts of the world. So last uh, couple of books that I just mentioned, I have already been mentioning the one on the right, which is Pluriverse, which has 100 stories of, uh, 100 uh, essays of uh, radical transformation. Geshe-la has an article there on uh, Buddhism uh, and, and many others. There's a copy outside for you to look at. And the one on the left is something we tried in 2017, asking 40 people who are uh, their own, you know, experienced or experts in different fields like uh, gender and sexuality, uh, conservation, education, health, uh, Adivasis, pastoralism, food, agriculture, etc., to write their vision of India in 2100, and then come back to the present and say, how do we get there? What are the pathways? What do we already have that? shows us how to get there, what are the challenges, the hurdles, etc. So a very interesting experiment. Uh, and again, there's a copy outside for you to see. Um, and talking about utopian visions, this is one of my favorite quotes. It is from an Argentinian filmmaker called uh, Fernando Birri, but it's quoted by the famous Latin American poet uh, Galliano. Um, I'll let you read it. I don't think I need to read it. But basically, why utopian visioning is important, however impossible you might think it is. So for me, uh, that split second contact with that monkey baby um, showed me the possibilities that we can and must continue dreaming of a better society and doing whatever we can in our own small ways or big ways to move towards that. And I'm hoping we're all part of that journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashishi. That was absolutely fascinating and wonderful. And um, yeah, that split second uh, eternity, absolutely gorgeous. I, I guess um, that little baby was responding to the spirit in you and the spirit in us. Uh, and it had the courage uh, to, you know, here's another alien species. And it's been doing a great damage, taking away all the homelands of all those all those creatures and all other creatures and yet it's an act of faith it, it, I am reminded of uh, Krishnamurti describing something like this in one of his books he, uh, you know Jiddu Krishnamurti and he was uh, at Banaras uh, in a little um, cottage along the Ganga and a huge monkey apparently came into his room and uh, Krishnamurti put out his hand, huge monkey, and he just held Krishnamurti's hand. And something very similar, uh, but you've captured it beautifully. Um, I think in Buddhism is all about Matri, um, you know, the four Brahmayas of Buddhism, uh, Matri, Modit, Karuna, Nopeksh. It's all about friendship. And I think that is friendship. So in, amongst all your diagrams, the middle was values. And I guess values basically means whenever the Lai Lama is asked what is your religion, he says it's kindness. Full stop. So gorgeous. So let's open this up for questions. I also love the utopian uh, slide, the last slide. Uh, you know, you go two steps forward and receive two steps. The whole point is that you walk the good path. I think that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we were born. Uh, is is spiritual exercise. Vivekananda used to say, the world is a spiritual gymnasium. We're here to have spiritual exercise. And uh, perhaps that's what your slide is saying. So, um, onward we march. So, questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Ashish, for 
for this fascinating lecture i just have two specific questions that to what extent do you think the difference in geographical spaces affect the human non-human relationship and contribute to the development of ecological self that is one question and the second question is that do you think that people especially uh, the academic environmentalist thinkers are aware of the division between human non-human and art as a living organism and uh, think of the ways to to actually um, distinguish the hierarchies instead of creating one. That thank you. That's that's those are the two questions. Thank you. <clears throat> um, please correct me if I'm misunderstanding the questions when I'm responding. Them. Difference in geographical spaces does that create a difference in uh, the way we look at? say the environment or uh, that's the first one, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by geographical spaces, but if, for instance, that includes um, living in a city versus living uh, in a village, um, yeah. that could? Uh, yes, to some extent. And also I mean very specific spaces, like for example, uh, say Amazon or Sundarban, that ah, is okay. different from like cities like Delhi. Different, yes. But I mean, in many fundamental ways, it will still be the same. If you've grown up in the Sundarbans as a part of the fishing community, or you've grown up in the Amazon as part of, let's say, the Sapara indigenous nation, uh, your sense of connect with the rest of nature would be the same. But it would be very different the reflection, sorry, the uh, mm, uh, how that is expressed would of course be very different because a forest is different from a mangrove system, which is different from, let's say, suppose you were a, a Maldhari kid growing up in uh, in the uh, in Kutch, right, which is a, a salt desert and grassland. So the uh, manifestation of that would be different, but it the sense of connect, the sense of responsibility, the the knowledge that you get from nature and the wisdom that you get from nature, those would be common elements. But when you then transfer that to, let's say, growing up in Mumbai, where you may not have access to connections with other species in the same way that the previous examples do it, then that would, I think, there would be fundamental differences there. In fact, there's growing studies, now, a growing amount of literature now uh, on studies which are showing how intellect and... Um, even physical uh, attributes are stunted when we grow up in areas that have very little uh, of the rest of nature in them. A uh, very interesting paper recently on how a diversity of bird sounds, when you grow up with that, not just bird sounds, but a diversity of bird sounds, that actually leads to much more alert mind than if you were not. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, in that sense, a geographical space could make a huge difference. Yeah. In the second question, you're saying, are environmental thinkers aware of the differences between uh, humans and other species? Is that? Uh, yes, and also I meant that instead of creating a hierarchy, like environment is created, uh, are they thinking of actually distinguishing the hierarchy and creating a symbiotic relationship? Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, in fact, some of the I mean, so indigenous people have always said this, right? So there's no the circle of life. But in modern science also, a lot of the, uh, this, this fascinating research now of people looking at, for instance, um, how have indigenous people spoken to whales? Hmm? There was a fantastic paper I read just uh, two weeks back on this. Uh, or uh, how do people have a sense of communicating with other species? And what could be a scientific way, scientific way of actually doing that? Even, for instance, recent things on the music that is created by plants. Yeah. Um, so, okay, they're using some new fancy mod modern gadgetry to actually uh, understand that. Uh, but they're actually coming to the same conclusions that indigenous people have been there for a long time, but coming at it from a different thing. Uh, the recent research with octopus, for instance, and how intelligent it is. The research with uh, vultures, the paper I read last week about how vultures are possibly the most intelligent bird species. And we always think of vultures as these, you know, we despise them for whatever reasons. Uh, crows and experiments with crows. Uh, gorillas is 30 years back experiment. So I think the more we actually try to understand whether through intuition and feeling and so on, or through hard science, the more we actually uh, are coming to the conclusion that there's no 
essential difference between humans and other species? There are differences, of course. I mean, I am not the same as the monkey that touched me, right? But in a sense, as a life form, we probably have much more in common than what we have in uh, difference. You know, the Dalai Lama has been having for many years these mind and life conferences. So, I mean, if you're aware, he brings scientists, quantum physicists and neuroscientists to talk uh, and look at what Buddhism tells us about the same things. And often, uh, and Doji has done this often, in at quantum levels, um, matter interacts with consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, you do your uh, light wave experiments and uh, you look at it in a certain way, it behaves as a wave. You look at it another way, it behaves as a particle. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no objective matter out in the universe. And codependent arising is this whole idea that all phenomena codependently arise. we in this together. Um, Rumi perhaps put it best. He said, consciousness sleeps in rocks, stirs in plants and wakes up in humans. It sleeps in rocks, still there in rocks. Otherwise, where would the quantum experiments work? Um, stirs in plants. Maybe a little more in the monkey, and then goes down in us monkeys because we are destroying the whole place. Mm-hmm. So we certainly are intelligent. So uh, yeah, more questions. There's many languages yes. that uh, I was. I have an interview on my channel uh, with this person called Tio Kasim Ghostors, who's a Native American Indian. I don't know; it's still called Indians, but anyway, Native American. Um, and he says that in our language, we have no nouns, uh, mm-hmm. which are objects. Everything is, the word is a relationship. So, everything is a relationship. Otherwise, what you do is you objectify somebody and and then you can other that person, which we do now even with people, and say, well, that's another, so I'm I'm able to exploit it or kick it off or kill it or whatever. But if it's a relationship, you would find that much more difficult to do. So, the central inside of Buddhism is no self. There's nothing has independent existence. Yeah. Yes, everything's a relationship. And in the Indian word for uh, civilization or culture is uh, samkriti. You know, Sanskriti actually the bindi the, is ma, samkriti. So, English word, all English comes from Sanskrit. Uh, the word similar comes from sam, creation comes from kriti. So the capacity to view all creation with an equal eye. Sari kriti jab ek saman dikhne ki shamta ho, to sam kriti hai. Otherwise nahi hai. Kuch bhi aap bana lije. Only if you can see all creation with equal eye. At the level of spirit, you're civilized, you're civil, you're culture. So, uh, and I, I loved another slide of yours which says, uh, celebrate life. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's why, uh, why else are we here for God's sake? Yeah? Not for long faces. Uh, yeah. Celebrate life, and how can we celebrate life if we're not sharing and we're not affectionate and we're not in a mood of friendship? We're competing, aggressive competition, power. <laughs> well, how can we? How can our lives be sustainable? Forget the planet. More questions, folks. Yeah. Yes, please. Who had this question? We had a question here. Unless uh, somebody else yeah. had a question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I've had my hand up. For a yes, while. please. Yeah. <laughs> No, I just wanted to thank Ashish for uh, for this message of hope because, um, you know, we often come up with this undergirded cynicism, you know, which I would call the Tina factor. There are no alternatives. You know, uh, the systems are too deep-rooted because what you've shown is not just, you know, it's not just utopian visions, which, of course, I love as a literature person. And, of course, we'll be having a discussion. I've written about utopias and we are part of a group which will be conversing on this more. But but the very grounded, solid, you know, um, case-based narratives that you brought to us. I think what that does is it, you know, it doesn't allow us to dismiss it as simply the dreams of some, you know, you know, this John Lennon kind of imagine, <laughs> right? Which is very easy to do. Right, that writers imagine and philosophers. So, uh, so it's the groundedness of your of your presentation that I really wanted to laud because it compels us to confront the often, you know, encountered objection that all of this is merely, you know, just talk. So, I just wanted to thank you for putting it out there in such concrete terms, you know, and to bring together a very global tapestry of it and you know and to link it to two historical developments the decline of the i don't think colonialism is done yet and neither is patriarchy 
but the fact that we've made huge advances there and you're bringing ecology there, I think that just raises the pitch you know, to another level. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. Just as an aside, uh, Maya, I've been saying these are not concrete examples, they're earthy examples. Because uh, yes. we have to move away from concrete. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ashish, sir, for such a wonderful uh, lecture today. Uh, two observations from my side. When we are talking about spiritual ecology, I think um, we should even focus on music and dance in a true democracy. I was recently attending uh, Ricky Tejas. Uh, show in Delhi and uh, he is a three times Grammy award winner. So when I saw his music and I'm a student of Buddhism, um, you know, and I was mesmerized by his song, Shine Your Light. And if you look at his words, you know, it really touched similar to I'm an animal lover myself. And the moment you showed me you know, I could understand. So, you know, that's one thing that I wanted to tell you. Secondly, Nepal is considered as a true Hindu country. Okay, recently, one of the lawyers, you know, he approached me and he told me that he is doing his PhD and, you know, relating Buddhism and law. I was amazed he is uh, staying in Nepal and he is a Hindu lord. I mean, please don't mind it, uh, me using those words. And his PhD work is relating law with Buddhism. And that also in a qualitative manner. So I have to ask him more questions, how he is doing it. Then he told me he has collected a lot of cases from the community in Nepal and so you would be amazed the way they are um, approaching the society picking up those laws and then I asked him from where did these um, how are you going to connect with Buddhism you know he told me and I was uh, amazed that yes um, they are picking up the narratives from the people who are living there from the Buddhist community and that's how he showed me the various narratives the cases and all so that is another spiritual because he is focusing on karma compassion karuna that is and a uh, lot of other things for noble truths from buddhism and everything so that's all um i wanted to pinpoint as a true democracy ecological democracy because that involved even animals also from here a question was raised because i was equally attending jainism course along with buddhism and i came across pythagoras theorem so, you know, Jainism and Buddhism in a country went, I mean, there are historical developments and stories that, yes, this is going on, this came first, that came first. However, when I saw the agamic studies in Jainism and Buddhist narratives, I did not find much difference. Though Jainism had different, and you know, if I have to be much more closer to spiritual ecology right now in India, they are considering Buddhism, Jainism as a minority class. And I had to raise up this question, why minority? You know, so if Nepal can do that, so why I wanted to pinpoint is that we have got a circular life that you have shown. Buddhism and Jainism will never come up in a circular form. They are giving equal status to <coughs> all the living forms. Uh, so somehow the uh, pictureization me, or the visualization. Sorry to interrupt. Can, may I know the, what is your exact question? My question is, can yes. we include these things also in spiritual ecology? So that's what I pinpointed in the beginning only. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think one of the things that I've said is the radical reinterpretations of religions, going back to maybe their spiritual roots and all of that. And like Geshe-la's article in the book, uh, Pluriverse, talks about that from a Buddhist point of view. There are similar articles from Jainism, Hinduism, uh, Islam, and so on in the book. So you can read them. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this needs to also uh, come in. But it will also then mean having to confront the... Uh, uh, the ossification that has happened to a lot of religions uh, confront the uh, uh, very rigid uh, hierarchies and inequalities that have also come into most probably all mainstream religion that will have to be challenged 
as we go to the fundamentals of these religions. But, and I like the, I mean, uh, I think you also mentioned this, that uh, the Dalai Lama has a book called Beyond Religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, where he says, I don't want people to be a Buddhist. I don't want people to be any religion, whatever. I just want people to be uh, ethical and moral. That's the fundamentals of all faiths, right? So in that sense, yes, it's very much part of this. Um, 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 Ajiji, thank you so much for your talk. In fact, uh, two things. First is, in your own words, I'd like to know what exactly do you mean by eternity in a second, number one. Number two is that the um, I, while I profoundly admire and uh, support all your efforts at the same time like say these concepts for example like no factories no minings no green the no gmo a green revolution and so forth these are amazing thoughts at the same time don't you think that the um what do you call it the gdp so the without these gdp will go down if that happens then neighboring countries they will attack you so how do you defend yourself? <laughs> this is what is happening. Difficult Ukraine, questions you ask. Oh, Ukraine, Ukraine issue. Yeah. So all these things are examples. Yeah, sure. No, thanks. Um, uh, the first one, well, both are, are difficult questions. Um, the first one, um, and I think I kind of failed to express that. Uh, I will probably still fail to express that. Um, the feeling that I felt, uh, the the profound, it's not even, I mean, profound, whatever, everything that I felt uh, when the baby monkey touched my finger or the penguin looked up at me and pecked my foot or whatever, uh, and, you know, many such experiences. To me, Encompass, uh, as I said, the whole of evolution, whether one looks at evolution from a spiritual sense or a scientific sense or whatever, and in that sense, in that split second, eternity was encompassed. So that's my uh, the way I'm kind of thinking of it. Um, uh, but it is also, of course, then beyond that in terms of uh, not just the material thing, but also the consciousness, the, everything that gets encompassed in that. And I, as I said, I, I think I'm very poor at expressing it. It's really what I went through then that love. gets expressed in that phrase, eternity in a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love of yeah. Now, no factories. Uh, well, firstly, <clears throat> um, I don't think uh, either I or any of us who are asking for radical transformations is saying no economic production. But what form of economic production? Yeah. So I gave the example of that Greek factory, which is run by the workers. Uh, it is a factory. But what they did was when they took over, they switched from chemical-based detergents to olive oil-based olive oil detergents. So they said, how do we become more ecologically sustainable? even though we are producing cleaning agents, right? But use natural products for that. And then, of course, the economic social transformations of becoming democratic uh, decision-making, equal wages for all workers, etc. But the ecological aspect was also as fundamental. So which is to say that they, neither they nor I are saying no production at all. Economic production, yes. In what way? For whom? How much? Uh, all that uh, is the important question and that we need to ask. If you take, let's say, GMOs, if the Dalit women farmers are saying we can produce enough in a dry land area with no irrigation, with no GMOs, with no chemicals, why do we need GMOs? So again, it's not that we don't need agricultural production and seeds, we do, but not through means that are being pushed for other reasons, especially profits and power. Right. Um, so now if we do that, it's possible that as a byproduct, GDP will rise. But that's a completely different approach than saying, let's first raise GDP and then make sure everybody gets the money, which never happens. Right. So the aim is well-being through these means. And as a result of which GDP may or may not rise, that is not important. Now, can we defend ourselves if GDP goes down? I think it would be a very interesting research if somebody could do it to ask whether high GDP countries are actually less prone to being uh, invaded than low GDP countries. Perhaps that is the case. But then that's where we need to change global relations. This cannot happen without also global relations changing. 
that there has to be a simultaneous kind of a struggle for also changing global relations. If we move towards, let's say, bioregionalism, yeah, where uh, the Thar Desert, the Sundarbans, the Tibetan Ladakh Plateau, all become zones of peace governed by the local communities, then do we still need an army? Are we still threatened by the neighboring country? Yeah. So these things will have to happen simultaneously, which makes it that much more difficult. But it is these visions and moving towards this. Let's take uh, European Union. Not a great example for other things, but World War II, could anybody have imagined that that could be stopped and European Union could be become something where anybody is able to go free, uh, freely back and forth without any visas or passport? So why can't that happen in South Asia? World War II was way worse. Uh, I don't know why people still, sorry, I'm still calling it World War II. European War II was still was way, way worse than, uh, than what our situation in South Asia is. But people moved out of that. So I think it's possible to dream and to move towards that. And this will happen, have to happen together. Otherwise, you're right that a stronger country is likely to take over. And then, you know, what's the point of doing all of this? Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yes. so uh, very nice lecture, sir. So my question is, uh, like um, you have told in one slide about the uh, alternative media and communication technology. So there are a lot of environmental skepticism is there, climate change denial, uh, people are there, pseudoscience there, and then fake news is there. So how we can deal with them? And how we can motivate people to like uh, uh, do the uh, environment conservation and, and those activities? I think one of the reasons why uh, we get swayed by fake news or denialism or what's happening in, in the religious sphere these days is because we have been deliberately dumbed down in school. We have not been encouraged to ask questions. We have not been encouraged to believe that we have the ability to think for ourselves and not have somebody else thinking for us. And unless we, until we change that, which means fundamental changes in the education system or how we, you know, how children grow up in our families or whatever, um, I don't think we'll be able to deal with fake news because we will always believe what somebody else tells us because it's coming to us from some technological gadget and say, oh, this is if it's on television. Pe hai. You know, so... Um, so it means these are long-term things. There's no overnight solution that I can think of. But what can happen in the short run is these alternative media spaces. Community media. We have 150 community media stations, uh, community radio stations in India. Many of them are run not so well, but many are run very well, like the one that I showed you with the Deccan uh, women. That's going to like what the DDS, uh, the Deccan, the Dalit women run goes to about uh, 300, 400 villages. So they're able to tell their stories which mainstream media will never tell. So the more we're able to create those spaces, even in the short run, we can, you know, try and dispel with or challenge fake news mm -hmm. uh, or or media or uh, websites like uh, fake news.com or whatever it is or something, right? So there are, there's always a counter trend that can be uh, encouraged uh, and the same with, uh, with technologies. Uh, but at the fundamental level, radical democracy is about each one of us having the capacity to think for ourselves, to act for ourselves, to question things, or what Krishnamurti always said, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, that has to change at the level of each one of us as a child and a young person. So, as always, uh, you know, one can go on for eternity, <laughs> but we have limited time. So, I believe uh, Dr. Williams, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Um, who who had a question? No, our friend. Yeah. Okay. Let Let's make it quick then. All right. Let's uh, be democratic. But yes. Let's do it quickly. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm Hyungjin from South Korea, and I I want to express my gratitude so uh, to share your insight. And I have one one question. Uh, actually, I was very impressed by one advertisement about environment environmental campaign, a, a eco friendly campaign uh, that. Urinating during the shower, yeah, it can re it can uh, reduce amount of water spending, uh, spend and yeah, it can help many 
poor people around the yeah the rural remote area and that because that is actually in my country South Korea um, urinating in public shower room uh, like gym swimming pool this is the most representative representative uh, that rude behavior yeah so yeah sure yeah in my opinion so it, there are many conflicts between our common sense and eco-friendly behavior mm. so I think we should uh, change our habitus by education and culture. But in my problem is that we, uh, the problem is that I think we don't have that much of time. We have very limited time because our air pollution and climate change is almost reaching limit. But yeah. on yeah, yeah, but on the other hand, if strong government lead every individual people to uh, follow their eco-friendly uh, direction. Uh, I think I'm afraid that it can be also one another kind of totalitarianism. So we, we mentioned this, will have, this, to be, dilemma. this yeah. will have to be cultural changes. It cannot yes. be something that is dictated to us from above. Uh, whether it's urinating while you're showering or whether it, for instance, those of you going to Ladakh are demanding a flush toilet when there's a perfectly good dry toilet that can be used, but you don't want to use the dry toilet because you think it's dirty, blah, blah, blah. Um, or, for instance, using uh, human manure in agriculture. Ladakhis have been doing it for centuries, but uh, if you go to the rest of India, they'll say, oh my God, no, 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 that's like, you know, how can we eat food? that is growing with manure that is coming from our own toilets kind of thing. So there's also a lot of cultural issues, caste issues, gender issues that kind of get built into this, which is why it needs, it's not something that you can dictate from above. It has to be those cultural changes, uh, consciousness changes that will have to come up. Um, can we collect the questions yeah. together? We have yeah. limited time. So uh, Dr. Williams had a question. Uh, I did. I realized that you'd love to bring this to a close, Vivek Ji, so I'm going to try to frame this. Uh, as short as possible as a comment and invite perhaps a comment from Ashish Ji later and because uh, I'd love to hear more about it on this specific topic. But Ashish Ji, I'd like to commend you and thank you for what was a very stimulating presentation on an important topic. I see this topic as important for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that while these alternatives are out there, we hear very little about them and they're just not well known enough. And it's so important, the things that you're writing, these kinds of uh, lectures for us to hear about them and to reflect upon them. One of the things I'd like to invite all of us to reflect upon, and I would have invited uh, Shishji to talk a little bit more about this, is what you hit at the end of your talk, where you were talking a bit about what, what can we do in order to support, to help, to cultivate these kinds of alternatives. It's not just learning about them, but the real difficulty of encouraging them. And, and, and one of those ways you did speak about is helping them to connect with one another, which is not an easy task at all. And uh, there are attempts to do this. And you, you didn't mention one that I was a little bit surprised at the absence of, but there is uh, the World Social Forum, the next one being held in two weeks in Nepal, which is a way in which these kinds of groups get together and talk with them. But I'd love to hear more from you, Ashish. I'd love to encourage you all to think about what it is that we can do to help and encourage and cultivate these groups. Thank you, Dr. William. Ma'am? Thank you so much, um, Ashish. That was a fantastic lecture. So very quickly, in an age where Karl Polanyi was right, the economic is not divorced from the social and political, but in an age where political democracy is under challenge, economic democracy is definitely under challenge, why do you have faith in ecological democracy? And I put this uh, in your reply to Venerable Geshela, you spoke about a changing global order, but if we think about the changing, like a multipolar world, where in fact, you know, those who were colonized now have dreams of, you know, leading the kind of advanced lifestyle of those who were the colonizers. Uh, don't you see ecological democracy being more under threat than ever? So I would love to know, without being cynical, but just... Yes, please. Yeah, my question is generally, uh, in that five petals, the central, this thing is values. And I think it's very closely connected with moral and ethics as well. So the point is that uh, in our education system, of course, we have uh, we have no exposure 
or uh, no proper understanding of moral ethics values this is moral science is probably one subject that we have which most of us have ignored in school and uh, then also what happens is that when you get into for example i am an engineer and an mba so when you get into that stream then you get further divorced from any exposure to this thing unless you have a particular uh, uh you know yearning for it on a personal level so i am quite curious whether there is a possibility of a consensus on a global level or any kind of consensus on what are the values that uh, you know we are aspiring for as a society all right so we take this here okay so uh, dr williams uh, <clears throat> uh world social forum i didn't mention it here but in fact we're all going to be there at the nepal world social forum and the global tapestry of alternatives uh, is very much linked to it um but the world social forum itself i mean in a nutshell uh, and we can certainly talk about this more uh the promise that it showed in the first 8 uh, 10 years of its existence over the last few years it's kind of for various reasons it's got ossified and all it's trying to reinvent itself through the uh, what's it called the world social struggles assembly or assembly of world social struggles which is interesting so let's see but it is certainly still a very important uh, forum where we can engage and we what we want to do is to bring the energy about radical alternatives there because much of the world social forum focus has been on resistance which is needed and it's still important but the slogan another world is possible what we want to do is to bring saying another world is happening and what more then needs to happen so it's that relationship that we're trying to build with with that uh, but through any of these forums to create more networking to create more connections to create more solidarity and to do it in a horizontal way and not have a small clique of uh, old muslim men uh, dictating what should happen in a global network i think that's a lesson we need to also learn from the world social forum however much i respect it there are problems um ecological why do i have faith in ecological democracy but i think uh, uh, maybe i wasn't able to explain it well enough i don't think ecological democracy is divorced from political democracy and economic democracy in fact they're all that's why the petals are together um why i think i have a great, uh, why i think this might just work is to go back to what i said about the anti colonial struggles anti patriarchal struggles and now the ecological revolution because i do believe i may be totally wrong and i don't think i'm going to be alive to see whether it works or not but i do believe that we're on the cusp of an ecological revolution and i think that's partly because of the fact that now we know the earth is one maybe indigenous peoples always knew that but now even from a, a so called rational point of view we know that it is one the climate crisis is giving us this sense that we are one planet and that what i do here can have impact somebody a thousand miles away um to me this is actually a great basis for an ecological a revolution in ecological consciousness and through that also then the actions that are there and therefore perhaps uh, um some amount of hope in radical ecological democracy um values ethics and morals uh, yeah education system i mean we i remember we used to have something called value education right there was there was something like that it was boring it was boring as hell i mean i i did not learn any values in that right so <laughs> what we need is to inculcate these in a subtle way yeah um how do teachers behave with kids how do parents behave with kids what do we when we're doing engineering for instance are we actually looking at the rest of the planet in a way that is uh, respectful those that's what we need to bring into all the subjects and also break down the barriers between subjects there is absolutely no reason why biology should be taught separately from geography from sociology from economics from whatever these have to come together uh in some way so the so called interdisciplinary i would not even say interdisciplinary but transdisciplinary breaking those borders um is really really important for us to do that which are then fundamentally based on these the ethics of of mutual respect the ethics of generosity the ethics of love the ethics of uh, respecting all life um that is the <coughs> that's the value education that i would argue for and not as a subject i remember we did a report for the ministry of environment 25 30 years back uh they asked us to do a report on the state of environmental education and what needs to change and what we said was environmental education as a separate subject is a disaster 
People will learn it for exams and then forget all about it. Environment needs to be infused in all subjects. And it can be done in fun ways. You can learn mathematics by counting, you know, numbers of species or whatever. There's so many different ways in which you can do that. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Even the Supreme Court gave an order saying environmental education is a mandatory subject for all primary schools. So TK, it's there as a thing, but it doesn't really end up doing much except stuffing some information in the minds of kids. So those fundamental changes, I think, are needed for values to become infused in, in our sort of daily uh, daily life yeah one exercise we do sorry one exercise we do with uh, we used to do i used to do in my old school sadar patil vidyalaya in delhi which is where i studied is uh, i used to run the nature club there um, is to look at the dustbin at the end of the day what has been thrown into it every product uh, pick it out and say where has it come from and where is it going to go and when the kids start doing that they actually realize that there's things they should never have thrown or things that they go back to their parents and say, why did you give me this product and not that? You know, parents were complaining to us saying that you're getting children to ask us awkward questions. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that we need to do much more. Uh, thank you. I think democracy is about conversation, uh, both debate and dialogue. And I think we've had it here. And spirituality is all about sharing and interconnecting. And I thank David House for organizing this great conversation uh, under the blessings of His Holiness. And may we continue to have such discussions and may a lot of action come out of this. And we may uh, collectively uh, change the very face of this planet. I agree with you. I think this crisis has forced us, if nothing else, to reawaken. And I think we should take this opportunity out of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vivek Sunilkarji. And I would also like to convey my thanks to Mr. Ashish Kotariji. Now, may I take this very opportunity to uh, kindly request our director, uh, Venerable Geshe Dojit Amdullah, to kindly speak a few words and give, a give the concluding remarks before we end this session. So I, for sure, I'll not take uh, much of your time. In fact, <clears throat> the reason why uh, the, I like to say some words here is for the, for the fact that <clears throat> this presentation is amazingly the beneficial and that the, the, I would say that the world should hear this and there should be some change. Um, so let me just identify some very important words which RCG indicated that all workers get same wage despite what they work and how to be responsible and the core va values and access to good water, air instead of GDP. Then cooperation among the people, Swaraj, learn from others, inspire others, be inspired by others, global tapestry, dreaming of better societies, change global relations, and so forth. So all these, we see that they are extremely the important ideas. And um, also that, that people here, no doubt, that uh, we are interested, we are keen to work towards this. At the same time, how to make it, how to materialize that? This is a very serious question. How to materialize this? And yes, towards the end, Ashish also touched on this area. Uh, as a subject, is it really beneficial? Or, so what needs to be changed? I would say that one thing, we have the Dr. Ashish who you have seen, how his presentation, there's so much passion in there. And in fact, why uh, Mr. Ashish is here, for the Bell's talk was that last time we invited him for another talk. And it was extremely inspiring, very academic. At the same time, there's a heart there. So this is something which is required. So for all these programs like the what Ajiji to his end indicated, are the model the model science which used to be taught in the various schools. 
And there was a problem. People learn what are the, the, the values, A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then they, they have no value. So let me share with you one thing, that once, while we have these topics, subjects there, but the, um, still it is not adequate. What Ashiji said is very precise, very precisely indicated, that once I was invited for a conference, and the conference, the, the title of the conference is Conflict Resolution. Let me repeat it, Conflict, conflict Resolution. And I was so busy. And the organizer who created this topic, Conflict Resolution, and he was in the Asking Tibet House to ask the director to send him the, the my concept note or my what abstract. Then the uh, yes, I was so busy, I was traveling, traveling, traveling. I could not, and I was always this. They're asking the secretary, please tell him that I'll get back to you soon, soon, soon. And one day he sent a message, email to the office, saying that, what's the topic? Conflict resolution. And the email that, that I got from the convener of the program, the conference, conflict resolution, said that, ask him not to come to the conference. <laughs> ask him not to come to the conference. He cannot even send the abstract in time, right? So this is where we have to, we have to walk the talk. So therefore, as a subject, people will learn, but we will not walk the subject. So therefore, how to make it happen? This is an extremely important point. So this is the issue. This is where we get stuck. The everywhere, once I was again asked to be the chair of one of the very important talks by prominent, I think, uh, the Padmavijan, the awardee. And he gave a talk for one hour. At the end, what he said is that, that finally the ultimate source of happiness is to, to have communion with the ultimate. To have communion with the ultimate. And he did not speak anything how to have the communion with the ultimate. And he stopped. I said, your next book should be on how to have the communion with the ultimate. Uh -huh. So this is the way we get stuck. So with this in the mind, the, it is my responsibility just to introduce both of them. Dr. Ashiji, you have already seen him. And then Professor, Professor Vivekji. So why we requested him to be the chairperson today here is for the reason that he was the one who actually brought this principle of the universal ethics, which Dr. Ashish indicated, universal ethics beyond religion, um, on such a large the platform, Delhi University, when he was the Pro Vice Chancellor of Delhi University, Pro Professor Vivek Suneji. So in fact, you be with him, you'll feel that this is the embodiment of this person, is the embodiment of universal ethics, just if you can see that Dr. Ashiji is the embodiment of what he's speaking. So finally what we need is that each one of us, in what way we can embody ourselves, like two of them, in what way, little way we can be, embody ourselves to lead our life more compassionately, more compassionately towards yourself, towards your family, and towards your friends, towards the ecology. This is the spiritual ecology. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Venerable Geshe-la. Um, now, uh, I would like to request our director, Venerable geshe -la, once again, to kindly present the Sobhana and the White Scarf to our chairperson, Mr. Professor Vivek Sunejaji, and our guest speaker, Mr. Ashish Kotariji. Uh, Venerable geshe -la. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a big round of applause for Mr. Ashish Kothariji, our guest speaker for today's evening session. <laughs> Professor Vivek Sunajaji, our chairperson, 
for today's evening session. Thank you, Gisela. Um, now, before <clears throat> before I conclude the session for today's uh, annual lecture on spiritual ecology, um, le let me just wind it up on this note that this lecture was today's lecture was exceptionally enlightening and really thought prov pro uh, thought provoking for all of us, and prompting us to reflect deeply and consider implementing valuable insights for the future. Moreover, it underscored the importance of raising awareness regarding gender equality and advocated for an approach that recognizes its ecological benefit. So basically today, um, the very morale and the lesson we learned today is all about the interdependent interdependency uh, um, in this world uh, that all of us, all living beings and uh, plants, humans, animals, we are all interdependent to each other and we should not break the very ecosystem of uh, of this world. All right, but on this note, uh, at the same time, I would also like to thank uh, all the participants who are gathered here for you know, taking out your valuable time. And especially during the question answer session, I would like to thank all the participants for you know, taking this very opportunity and making the best use of this opportunity uh, to ask questions to um, our guest speaker, Mr. Ashish Kotari ji. Thank you very much. And um, I would also like to thank uh, our director, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdila, for always guiding us, you know, and uh, you know, directing us to a path uh, which we all desire. And at the same time, you know, um, I would also like to thank our secretary, Mr. Tenzin Kunyabla, for always leading us and you know, supporting us with uh, uh, with every effort, exceptional effort, and also my colleagues, uh, Mr. Sering Pundula, Mr. Rabyang, Mr. Rabyangla, my colleague, Ms. Tenjing Domala, um, Kama Zumbala, and uh, Kama Sijula, and uh, Mr. Legmanla, and I have a few more names. Uh, without taking much time, I would like thank I would like to thank each and every one of them for making this evening session a wonderful and a grand success. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Good night. Thank you.